All right, I know people are gonna start trickling in because they're out there doing health and wellness. Maybe they're gonna totally ditch because they're out there like enjoying their snacks and health and wellness and maybe not wanna hear about discussion boards, but I'm so happy you guys are here. Yay. Okay, so um, the title of our, our little uh, breakout here is about the discussion boards, dystopia to utopia. So I wanna start by kind of posing a question to you guys. Oh, clicker. And that is, if we were able to create a utopian environment here at BYU-Idaho on the discussion board, if we could craft and create just the bomb class, the bomb discussion board, what would it look like? What would be happening on the ideal discussion board if it were working the way we want it to work? Rachel. They're engaged and they're actually learning and teaching one another. What else? Tanya. Like just a rote. Yes. 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 Yeah, like they actually treat it like it's a place where they can get to know and talk to their peers, not just let me pop my head in, right? Yeah, right, right, yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I'm going to um, show you a video really quick. And as you're watching the video, I want you to think to yourself, What's wrong with this situation? What went wrong? This is a bad example. It's an awesomely bad example. And it's put out by BYU-Idaho, which makes it even better. After I finish writing words, I'm gonna eat pie. I, I need pie. I would have migrated to colonial America because I would seek freedom from oppression. I wouldn't have migrated because the abandonment of family would have forbidden me from such an act. I agree. I agree. Thanks. I believe I need more information before I can reasonably be respond, huh? Where am I from? What social demographic do I come from, huh? Yellow is used to represent cowardice? I thought that the color lemon was used to represent a lack of bravery. I believe that's what I just said, Carrie. Wow, great insight. I would have never thought of this. I agree. It reminds me of a time in my life when I was in a similar situation as King Richard. This class is so Just great comment. 
a great. You guys are so awesome. I learned so much. Good boy. I wouldn't want to be doing anything else in the whole wide world. I agree. Smiley face. LOL. That was awesome. Ace for everyone. Great comment. Sorry I'm late. I had a thing. But for obvious reasons previously stated, I want to migrate it. I agree. There's apple pie and chocolate pie and lemon pie and pumpkin pie. I'll love pie until the day I die. I like pie too. <laughs> okay, so raise your hand if you've seen this kind of discussion board before. What went wrong? Just start saying answers. What went wrong? Wait until the last minute. Students not posting, like, till right at the last second. What else? I agree. Yes, and they do it with like an explanation mark. I agree. Okay. Yeah, I agree too. What are you talking about? Yeah. What else? What else is wrong? So many things wrong. Not enough. He's like eating pie and looking at Pinterest. I mean, maybe we've done that before. I'm, I got mini M&Ms lined up. Like, as I'm posting, I'm rewarding myself sometimes. <laughs> All right, Bonnie. <laughs> yeah. No, and then like at the end, how he's like, that was awesome. You guys are great. I love you. Yeah, okay, so so many things wrong with this. Um, before we dive in, um, really quickly, I just want to talk a little bit about um, why we do online discussion boards in the first place. What's the point? Why are we doing this, especially if so many times we get results like this? Even though we're really good instructors, we're super engaged, we've been through the certification training, we've been doing this for several semesters, and yet sometimes we still find ourselves falling into the trap of the discussion board that we just saw. So why are we doing them in the first place? I have um, a few pedagogical examples. Thankfully, there's lots of data that's starting to come out since online classes have, have been around for a while now. <clears throat> Some resources like Cornell University um, share that it builds class community. In the online environment, where else are they going to get that peer-to-peer -peer interaction to actually feel like they're in a classroom if we don't have a discussion board where they can talk to one another? That banter that takes place in a classroom setting with the teacher and the students with each other, how much do students learn? through that banter that happens between the two of them. Um, it allows time for in-depth reflection, so students to actually sit there and say, here's a question. I actually have to think about something and provide some kind of reasonable answer. Um, they can respond to others, get new ideas, develop thinking and writing skills. Um, you could even bring in experts, or even that's what reading assignments are, bringing in expert opinions, having them analyze them and talk about them. Um, there's other things like demonstrating knowledge of key concepts, so making sure objectives are being hit within the course. Um, consensus building, so requiring them to work together to create something, to create a new um, paradigm that they are going to, um, I guess you could say, explore. Critical thinking, student leadership, all kinds of stuff. So there's pedagogical evidence that shows discussion boards are a very, very necessary part of any online teaching class. And I don't know of any researcher or theorist I've ever read that have said discussion boards are not something that should be in an online classroom. They are always arguing in favor of it. Um, but something else that's really interesting is the BYU-Idaho learning model also heavily reinforces this need um, for the discussion board. This is a direct quote. It says, this approach called the learning model is based on three key concepts. 
Prepare, teach one another, and ponder, prove. Students come to each class prepared to learn by studying assigned readings, completing required homework, and participating in online discussions in pre-class study groups. Through instructor-led discussions in class, students teach each other what they've learned, honing and refining their own understanding in the process. Later, students internalize their learning through review, reflection, and application. It goes on to say that Online courses are specifically designed to mirror campus classroom experiences. BYU-Idaho's online courses and degrees are facilitated by trained online instructors, include peer-to-peer -peer interaction, and foster rich learning opportunities. Um, this is reinforced as well in the instructor contract. How often have you guys, when you get that blessed email that says, we have a level one contract for you, and you're so excited about it, how often have you actually reviewed what your contract says you're supposed to be doing? 30% of it says facilitation. So say you have a three credit class and you're working 10 hours a week on it. That means three of those hours are supposed to be consecrated to facilitating your discussion board, contractually speaking. So I would say that it's pretty important to BYU-Idaho that we learn to be effective in this area. Otherwise, that three hours is going to be really boring for us <laughs> and for them. And of course, it's also reinforced by instructor standard number two as well as instructor standard number three. Okay, we're gonna move ahead here. So basically, Jody and I, and Jody really, this is her brainchild. She's so good at discussion boards, and she's the one that was kind enough to come to me and ask if we could do this, because we wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that the discussion board is supposed to be doing. So we're kind of merging together all the pedagogical evidence that we've seen for the purpose of discussion boards, what they're supposed to be achieving, as well as the BYU-Idaho learning model stuff of what they're saying they want it to achieve. And we're gonna talk about the how behind it, how we can accomplish it. So the first area that I'm gonna cover before I send it on to Jody um, is the idea that the discussion boards are meant to be a means of allowing our students to interact with one another as peers. It's supposed to be a building community, just like our online community is supposed to be building community, so we actually feel like we work for BYU-Idaho, we actually feel loved, we feel engaged. Likewise, this discussion board is supposed to be doing that for our students, making them feel like they go to BYU-Idaho, making them feel like they are part of a classroom, that I'm a human, they're all humans, so that's what this is supposed to be doing. So how do we do that? One of the primary ways that I do that within my class is something called an optional discussion board. We all have the questions and conversations page within our class where they can pop in and post these questions, but are you utilizing it in the best way possible? Sure, you're directing them to it so they can ask their questions, but this is also a great opportunity for it to serve as a hub for your students. Um, to explore different ideas. I've seen everything from people making it a happy thought spot where they have um, instructors come in and share good things that are going on in their life that week. If general conference is that week, it'll be a general conference spot where they say, you know, what are you hoping to get out of general conference this week? Um, something that I do in my course um, is I try to tie in instructor standard number one by building their faith by having a Mormon message discussion. So on my notes page each week, I embed a Mormon message um, that has to do with the content. It's always directly related to the content. So it never feels like I'm fulfilling my, <laughs> my build faith in my students requirement. It just feels organic and part of the content. And then I include a link in there where I tell them, please hop over here and share your thoughts about the Mormon message, where I ask them a direct question that allows them to get to know one another. So this particular week, it's the first week of term, and I ask them, what are your hopes for the future? What are you hoping to achieve? And they all sit there, and they hop on, and they share their hopes. And they respond to one another. And some of them are posting pictures of themselves and different things, and they get to know each other. It's that that kind of playful banter, talk back and forth, that normally would happen in any normal classroom if they were sitting in front of you, but you're giving them a space to actually make that happen. You're creating that opportunity. 
Um, something else that you can do, a lot of these ideas come from some of the TGLs I work with um, as an AIM. So these are drawn, some of them from Susan Richardson and some others from um, Dana Romney and there's a third person I'll remember soon. I wanna make sure I give them credit in case you're watching. Thank you. So you can do challenges for the students that encourage them to get to know one another on a deeper level. So you could do something real simple like saying, follow up your initial post with a question. I do this within my class every single week. It's not required. I make sure they know it's an invitation. Um, but if they're asking questions, then they become the facilitators of their own discussions. It's no longer me just trying to get them to talk to one another. They're actually taking the step and saying, I want to initiate conversation with you. You can ask them to ask their peers questions in response posts so that it's showing that they're actually reading it and they're saying, hey, what do you mean by that? Can you explain that a little bit further? And they're starting to talk to each other and then they start joking with one another and it starts building a community and they start to get to know each other. Um, reply to initial posts that don't have a response post yet. So looking out for their peers. I mean, no one wants, if you're in a real class, to not have someone that cares what you said. I mean, that feels icky. So if you encourage them to, to take note of that kind of thing. Um, you can have them answer their peers' questions. Um, integrate things like a personal experience that's related to the topic, related to the lesson material, but something where you can get to know something about their own life. Um, something else, this comes from Dana Romney that she does that I love, is she does something called notable quotables where if she sees something really, really cool on the discussion board that week, she embeds it and creates like a meme that she puts in her announcements the next week where she shares something really, really cool one of the students was talking about and she calls it a notable quotable. So they get to know something about that student, which I think is pretty cool. Um, one final idea that I have, and this depends on the course content for you. I taught an English 450 class a while back. And in that, there was an assignment for them to, for me to select editors in chief that were basically going to be like team leaders for this big, massive project. And it's a project that they needed lots of support from one another on. And I said, guys, what would be the best way for you guys to support one another and get to know each other and help one another? And one of them suggested to me, can we have a Facebook page? Like, we're on social media way more than we're ever within the iLearn course. So I know that you said we can use this space within the course, but I'm asking, can you create a group? Sister Jackson, are you on social media? Can you create a Facebook group for us? I'm like, sure. So I created an English 450 social media uh, Facebook group, and it was private, and I invited all of them to come to it. So much traffic. They all were talking about the problems they were facing. They're helping each other. They're sharing the progress they're making on their magazine project. And it was absolutely wonderful. And I know that some of them are continuing their friendships even today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jody to talk to no about number two here. Sarah is awesome, and and I think she gave me credit because I can do a little piece of this, but she's really helped me to organize discussion boards and really focus them. So I wanted to start out. Obviously, the discussion board we worry the most about are the signed ones, right? The question and answers are super important. That's the social side, but the assigned ones are really important. And so we have to make those meaningful. And the number one way to make them meaningful is to make sure that we're talking about what we need to discuss on that particular discussion board. When I started to think about this and how I could make this more fulfilling for my students and less work for me, I'm an online student. I'm, I don't know if I'm proud or embarrassed to admit I've been an online student almost as long as I've been an online instructor. I, have a addiction to going to school. So, but discussion boards as a student's always really hard for me too. And then one day something flipped in my brain for me. Discussion board is where I get to go be with my parents. It's where I get to go to class. So my experiences in face-to-face -face class are really fun. And my favorite part of teaching in a face-to-face -face class is when your students don't jump up and leave when they linger, when they want to come and talk to you a little bit longer about something they learned or an idea that was expressed in the class. And you really can't get out of the class and onto the next place where you're supposed to be because your students want to talk to you. That's a really rewarding feeling. And so I tried to start to think of ways that would make that environment on the discussion board. It's not super easy to do. But a couple of things that I found that have worked 
is to really notice when a student, and you won't be able to read this very well. I, I thought, okay, do I put up when a, a sample of when they're not demonstrating the key concept of the discussion board? And then I realized, no, because everyone can say that. The number one answer is I agree, right? Or, oh, glad you said that. I learned something from that. And those are all great comments, but they don't demonstrate knowledge of key concepts. So I spend time telling my, teaching my, students that the only way I can see what you are learning is if you show it to me. And in an online environment, the only way you can show it is to use your words or to use your thoughts. And this was an excellent example. You can't see it. But the question was, how do you help a friend that's struggling? So this is, a, this is an opportunity to analyze, right? Critically think, I understand this principle. How would I help somebody else? And this um, student spent a lot of time talking about an opportunity she and her husband had to teach a neighbor about self-reliance and how that changed the neighbor's life. So it was really exciting. So the next thing I did is, on the discussion board, I responded. I asked her questions about how the opportunity came about and, and how long between the time they shared their testimony and that principle of self-reliance to when they actually learned. It turned out to be years. It was years later that they learned that that time with that friend ended up making them more self-reliant. But in the discussion board, I mean in the evaluation of the discussion board, that's where I take the time to really let, let my students know and you'll see that long word in there, operationalized. That's an assessment geek word. But what it means is it's not always really clear to a student what the rubric criteria means for them. So I take a few minutes and say, when I say all four posts on the topic um, show that you understand or comprehend the subject and the lesson context, that's what I'm looking for. Are you focused? Are you adding new insights? Are you sharing how you use this principle that we're talking about in your own life? Or, or are you showing me how, how you learned about it? And so I'll go through and give them the appropriate points, but then I'll say exactly, hey, you showed me you know this principle when you said this. So I'm really careful about the feedback when I grade discussion boards. It takes a little more time, but after a while they get in the habit and they're pretty good about staying on topic and remembering they have to show me what they learned and that's one place where they can do it. Student to student instruction and feedback. It's important to challenge the students to ask each other questions and answer each other questions. This happens a lot for me on the, on the question and answers discussion board too because I don't get to go to the gatherings. I'm a pathway instructor. So I always ask them, go on the question and answer discussion board and tell me about your gathering. I didn't get to be there. Tell me about it. They have a lot of fun explaining they got to be the lead student or they like to share what they've learned and how they've learned it. So even if you don't, your students don't have a gathering or, or your situation is different, think of ways to invite them to share what they know and how it's changed them or their family or someone at work, share what they know and get excited about that. Be really excited about that. How did you, I asked in that, pre in that previous example that I showed, how did you feel when you realized that your example had helped someone? All these years later, you're remembering some, an interaction you had with a neighbor and you realized the difference it made in that family's life. How did you feel? And we had a great discussion we had a great discussion about that. I, um, I, put this, I put this meme up there. Sometimes I have students, especially because I teach language learners, that don't feel comfortable writing a lot of information. So when I say that, I, so when I find that out about them, or when I notice they're not posting as much, I'll send them a little note, or I'll give them feedback in my evaluation of their discussion. I'll say, if you're struggling to find the words, pictures work. It's so easy to make a meme, and I'll teach them how to do that. And, and there are a lot of resources. I use Adobe Spark, because it's the super easiest program, and it's right online, and I just go on Adobe Spark and find a picture that I need and add the words that I want, and then I download it and post it. And so I encourage my students to find another way. We love audio. Some don't want to do a video, but they might do audio. So encourage your students to find a way that helps them express themselves the best. This is Sarah's. Okay, I want to start this section um, by posing a question to you guys because this is huge for me. Um, this, is, this is implementing the learning model that we're really, really supposed to be implementing. What I would say is one of the most core reasons for why we're doing this discussion board at this university. 
So the learning model encourages instructors to create opportunities for students to teach one another what they are learning and then ponder and prove those things that they're believing um, at that moment. Um, how can the discussion board effectively facilitate this process for students? What do you do in your own course to help students effectively use the discussion board as a springboard for the learning model process? So it's supposed to be teaching, they're supposed to be teaching one another, actually teaching one another, not regurgitating information, not agreeing with one another. They're supposed to be teaching each other and they're supposed to be pondering and proving or maybe even rejecting some things they thought they knew or believed. How do we do that on the discussion board? What do you guys do? Alicia. Yes. Love it. Love it. Yes. Yeah, so you're actually saying you're being vague right here. Give me specifics. Yeah, wonderful. Asking, asking questions, asking them to elaborate. Anyone else? You guys better not be falling asleep. I can talk real loud. Okay. Okay, so this is probably the biggest game changer for me in terms of my discussion board. And I have a picture here and I'm gonna try to explain it as well as possible because I think sometimes people get confused on exactly what it is. But I call it setting yourself up for success. Now, I've become good friends with iLearn 3.0. I have, like we are simpatico, finally. But when I first got on iLearn 3.0, I found that all of the discussion board facilitation techniques that I was like the Jedi master of in 2.0, like did not transfer, did not transfer at all. So I was like, I got this. I get on 3.0, oh my goodness, I don't have this. This doesn't work. Oh, I was doing this. I was doing this initial post and everyone was responding, but no one can find it in 3.0. It's getting buried. It's getting buried under everyone having to generate new threads and I can't stop them from generating new threads and it's chaos and anarchy. And that's how I felt the first semester. I really did. I was like, this discussion board is, there's no way to fix it. There's no hope. It's time to quit. No, I didn't think that, but I was like, something's got to change. It was really bad. It was really bad for me. And I, it wasn't providing an environment that was conducive for them to teach one another because they couldn't even see what each other was saying. It was horrible. And I'm like, how are they going to teach one another and ponder and prove concepts if all they're doing is, you know, expanding two student posts so that they can hit that minimum requirement and then collapsing them back and being like, peace. Just like how they said, I agree. Bye. I'm out. And then they don't come back. And they're not viewing them. They're not even viewing the posts. Um, so I thought, what can I do about this? So um, I decided to create prompt threads. So most of us that have discussion boards in our course, there are specific questions they're supposed to be answering, correct? So in my English 106 class, there could be anywhere from one to three things they could pick from to respond to that particular week. So instead of just having them create new threads and it being a complete free-for-all where everyone's generating a new thread and you have to expand and collapse and you don't see what anyone's saying, I decided to take those and to create prompt threads out of them. So you'll see right here, I don't know how well you can tell, but I see how I say post here in all bold. I talked to Dave Ashby if there was a way that we could prevent them from creating new threads because it would literally save my life because I do so much mentoring to make sure my students know that they're supposed to post within the thread that's already generated and not create their new thread. So all I do is however many prompts there are that week, I create a prompt thread for each of the questions they have the option of answering. And I ask them to post within the corresponding thread. So not only does this make it so the discussion board and all the student posts are organized thematically, because they're all answering the same question if they're posting in post here, prompt three, editing, so they want to engage the question about editing. Every person who's engaging the question about editing, their post is being put in there. And then when you click on that, as either the student or the instructor, it expands every single post. 
So you're reading all of them. You're not having to click and expand them individually. They're all encased within it. Um, and that's helped exponentially in terms of, of them actually reading what each other is saying. Um, but that is just half the battle. Um, you gotta utilize your groups. I know a lot of um, you guys already have pre-assigned groups, I guess you could say. It, you gotta determine what the right group size is, but I do know that having at least two groups is highly beneficial um, for better, um, better communication, more specific, um, more critical thinking. Yes? Okay, so I teach an English 106 class. I generally don't have non-participators. Um, by the time they get to me, they, they're there. They're in it to win it. It's one of their last semesters there. Um, so I have 30 students in any given semester. I create two groups. So I have about 15 students per group. I can't, I wouldn't encourage to go any smaller if you're gonna do the prompt thread idea because they're gonna be posting within their individual prompt threads and say if you have only like seven students per group and two of them are sick that week or they're late in posting and then they're all posting in different prompt threads, it's, it's harder for the discussion to really get generating and boiling the way you want it to. But if you have a little bit larger, um, even if some aren't posting, um, you have more. Yes. Okay, so let me tell you. No, I asked Dave Ashby to create something. I'm like, use your skills to create something so they will stop doing that. Um, but at present, there's no way to do that. I'm waiting for the training video to be unveiled that says you can do that. So here's what I do to prevent them from doing that. Um, what I do is not within these ones, but in the actual directions for the discussion board at the top, I put like in bold, and even sometimes I'll highlight portions of it in red that say, do not create your own prompt thread. Please respond to one of the existing prompt threads. That takes care of about half the class. And then the other half is still that first week gonna be all be like posting, like anarchy and chaos. But then what I do is I go in and every student who's posting in the wrong place, I first, engage what they said, follow it up with a question and let them know that I'm like, wow, that was really great, super insightful. And then I just put a little asterisk at the bottom <clears throat> where it's like a side note that's addressed just to them where I just say, in the future, would you mind posting within the existing prompt threads? And I show them even like a screenshot of see how it says post here like that's where I want you to post next week. And it's like half the class, so you're not calling them out or making them feel bad when it's half the class. Then usually by lesson three, I only have like one or two. And in that case, I do the same thing or if it's becoming too selective and I don't wanna call them on it, I'll actually just email them. And I'll say, hey, you're, you're awesome, you're doing great things, but can you post within the prompt thread? And they'll do it. So now here I am. I think usually by lesson five, everyone's posting where they're supposed to be posting. It is not even an issue, it's a non-issue. I don't even have to put that directive at the top. And it's way organized and super, super efficient. Really? That's awesome. Wow. Well, maybe we need to talk to our course leads, huh? Yeah. Is there, I thought there was a way that you could hide things. Can you hide that window? Um, the thing that you can do that I do is I always pin. That's another thing. Always, always click that pin button that says you can pin your own post to the top. Because that means even if everyone else is generating their own threads, they're all gonna be posted underneath your post tiers. And that's something that really, really helps. But I never wanna hide the student's prompt thread because it is their thread and I want everyone else to participate, but I definitely want them to not mind to get buried because I want them to post um, where. 
Um, something else that you can do is do more academically inclined discussion board challenges to get them to teach one another more. Um, you guys can check out the PowerPoint later because I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, but something I mentioned that I do is I always ask them to ask a question at the bottom of their initial post. And you know what? Just by doing that simple thing from week in and week out and positively reinforcing it. So when I see a student do it, the first three weeks, I answer every question that a student asks. I literally, even if it's the whole class, I will respond to every one of those students and say, you asked an awesome question. Thank you so much for asking that question. Here's what I think about it. And I'm like one of the first ones that's answering their question and trying to show them that I noticed that they did it and to set a model for the rest of the students to start answering each other's questions. And you know what, as I do that, it's almost like a student spotlight. So all the other students are seeing, hey, Sister Jackson like really, really likes it when we ask questions. I want a compliment. And so they'll all start posting their questions. Now where I am here, I have over 75% of my students without it even being a requirement, just posting questions at the bottom. And they're all like being critical of each other sometimes and saying, I don't know if I agree with that and sharing life experiences. And it's really, really wonderful. So these are kind of some of the academically inclined discussion board challenges you could check out um, later. And then something else I do is questions for everyone. So for the entire group. And this is how I get them to ponder and prove. Because students sometimes aren't very good at thinking critically right out of the gate. They tend to want to get on the discussion board, get out, and they don't really want to think about what they're doing. So it is my job as the facilitator to make them think about what they're doing. And some way, one of the ways I do this is questions for everyone. Um, they work really, really effectively when I have the, the prompt threads. Because when I post my question for everyone, it's generally related to that whole prompt thread that everyone is responding to. And they all easily see it because it's not buried under 50 billion. It's, it's right there with everyone else's. Here's a couple examples of how I do it. I very seldom will ask a question to everyone that isn't building off something a student is saying. Because I'm trying to show them that they need to be building off one another, not just going rogue on their own and trying to think of something innovative that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But the idea is they're supposed to be forming connections. So Angie had a post. She asked a question. I answered it for her, tried to explore and brainstorm ideas. And then I decided to try to get them to think about it a little bit further in terms of their own personal life. And I posed a question to the class. Um, in this particular situation, um, I'm trying to, what am I trying to do? Oh, all the students, have you ever noticed that they're all agreeing with the reading assignments? They're fantastic. I agree. That was amazing. Well, there's some kind of bad persuasive examples in our class. So, when, And they do that purposefully. So whenever I hear everyone going, I agree, that's amazing, I sit there and think, well, out of all those essays you read, is there anything that rubbed you the wrong way? What didn't you like about what the author did? Did you see any evidence of logos in their essay? Did you feel like it was too heavy on the pathos or... Do you feel like you trust your reader? Do they have good ethics, good values? Can you see that? And then all of a sudden it generates all this thought of, I should get back in there. Is there anything I didn't like about that essay? And they'll start posting all kinds of stuff. Like, they had no logos. It was entirely emotion driven. I'm like, I know, right? They needed more logos. And then this is my shout out to myself for implementing the theme of the semester of sharing Sherry Dew's uh, talk, but just getting them to think about the content outside of the classroom and actually getting them to realize that what they're learning about is something that they can take and carry forward into other facets of their life, even building their faith. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Jody for Make Deeper Connections, and um, I'll pass it off to you. So one of the things I just wanted to piggyback on Sarah, because she was great at teaching this for me, is one of the ways that I helped my students decide to post in the thread instead of start their own was to tell them a why. And the why for me was if you post your own thread, it's like you're all in different classrooms shouting through the walls and we don't hear each other. But if you post in my thread, we're all there together and we're talking together and we're discussing. And that started to build that feeling I described earlier of they didn't want to leave. In fact, 
what used to really annoy me now really excites me because every once in a while I'll get somebody that goes back and posts in week nine or week eight and we're on week 12 and I'm like why are they posting back there but it's because something's happened and they want to express a follow-up to something we were discussing back then that's great right they're, they're enjoying they're enjoying it so the why for me in my class is we want to be all in the same room we want to hear each other we want to respond to each other this is the part that um actually really makes a difference for me in discussion boards, the part that I really look forward to. I am by nature a question asker. I'm fairly obedient. My comfort zone is when I know what I have to do to be obedient, but I always have to ask a question about so I can understand why I'm being asked to do something. So by nature, I'm a very, I am a question asker. I always have been. And I have found that questions make a difference in my learning. So promoting deeper connections and critical thinking really start with asking questions. So imagine how excited I was when I got an endorsement on my thought process from President Eyring. He said to ask and answer questions is the heart of all learning and all teaching. And if that's truly the case, then this dis discussion board's got to be a heart of our courses. It just must be, because where else do we ask questions and answer them as a group? There are many types of questions, and I'll tell you, um, there are a couple of places I need to attribute this to. If you, um, I, I started uh, the process of learning about asking questions in a formal way because I took an institute class that has to do with teaching in seminaries and institutes and they have a whole section on training instructors on how to ask the right kind of questions. It turns out that the teacher councils that we have in our wards on Sundays have a manual that teach you how to ask questions too. So this is kind of a combination of my experience and study and practice. These are the four main types of questions. Each of you, I hope, are going to discover your inner question asker. That might go clear back to when you were two, when all the question you ever asked was why, 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 why. But but find it and then fine tune it. Remember that the that President Irene teaches us to invite students to ask questions. You've heard us use the word invite a whole lot today. So don't be afraid of invitations. Invite students to ponder. Invite students to ask other questions. Invite students to share their ideas. Invite students to act on something that they've learned and share it. So the first type of question is invite students to search for information. I heard a really good example, I think it was from Mia Shell, who said, when you say to me, I learned from my own experience, you ask them to share where was that experience, how did that experience, when was that experience, why was that experience so different. Those are very questions that we hope our students are asking anyway when they're learning something, the how, where, when, and why, that's how they, that pedagogically, that's how they connect with text. The second kind of type of question is to analyze for understanding. How does this explanation help us? How does this story teach us what the principle we're trying to learn? What led to this outcome? How did you get here? Where were you and how did you get there? Ask them to, to analyze, why am I thinking that way? What is, what is making the difference in that question? And then, of course, inviting questions of feeling and testimony. Nothing strengthens learning than testifying of a principle. Nothing strengthens learning than testifying of a principle. Sharing your feelings, understanding it. Um, if you're around me very long, I'm, I just even in personal conversation, Sarah can probably attest to this, I start asking you questions. How did you get there? What did you think about that? Why is that important? Um, because that's how I connect, that's how I regulate my own feelings and, and come to my own testimony. Of course we don't want students to share inappropriate things, but generally they won't. Most of the time we don't want to put ourselves totally out there, especially in the written word. But, so don't be afraid to ask them, how did you feel about that? What about that ring true for you? Give them an opportunity to share. Testifying and sharing your feelings also gives you an opportunity to teach what you know. As soon as you're teaching what you know, you're learning more about what you know. 
the last type of question is application. And this, of course, is like the crux of all we do, right? As educators, we always want to know that our students learn something and can use it somewhere else, can transfer it, can apply it, that it has meaning in their life. So when a student has shared their feelings or expressed how something came about or why, the next question always should be, so what are you going to do now? How has that changed you? What's different now than, than before you understood this principle? How are you going to take this and share it somewhere? How does that make you a better student? One of the first things I always try to teach my students is that it's your job to teach me, to show me what you know. In a face-to-face -face classroom, maybe I can watch your reactions. Maybe I can tell when you're falling asleep. Or maybe I can tell when you're really listening to what I'm saying. Or maybe I can see when you finally got the concept by the expression on your face. I don't have that advantage in an online environment. So get really, really good at showing me everything you know. Give more detail. Show me where you used that. Because that's, that's how I can see your actual learning. Let's just take a minute and think about, I'm, I'm not going to, you're welcome to share, but how, how do you generate questions? What is your process for generating a question? How do you think of what question to ask a student? Do you have any ideas about how you do that? That's excellent. That's really key. That the spirit is totally key in this process. Other ideas? Are you by nature a question asker? Yeah, I'm a little bit of a contrarian. I, I, I use question asker because contrarian can skeptic. I, I've described myself. I could recognize that in you. In fact, um, this is one thing that I, I sometimes call it why thinking. Because I can be in a room and everybody can hear the same message and kind of be on the same page. And I'm over here thinking this other thing. Did anybody think about this? And, and sometimes that can make you feel really isolated. Sometimes it's really beneficial. But it is very helpful in learning to generate questions. Does anybody else have any ideas? How, how is it that you come to know the right question to ask your student when you're trying to learn something? Sharon? That's excellent. So one of the things that you learn when you're the mother of all sons, which is I am, is that boys hate questions. So to be a mother that's a natural, natural question asker and have sons that really get tired of you asking them questions, because then, I don't know, maybe, maybe men, I don't know, don't like to probe their feelings and discuss it. I don't know what it is. I just know that it's, it's a struggle for me. But I learned, I re learned really quickly that, that if you ask a question and a person thinks that you have an answer in your head that they're expecting, like you ask a question, like read my mind, I asked you this question, now read my mind and spit back that answer, students will stop asking questions, answering questions because they don't know how to read your mind. So it's really important to validate that.
It makes total sense. That's absolutely right. That's particularly true for international students who in some cultures are taught you don't ever question your professor. So we're out of time, but I just want to leave my testimony to you that it, discussion boards can make a huge difference in how you feel about your course and how your students feel about you. So I hope that this has been really beneficial to you and I really appreciate, we really appreciate you taking the time to share with us and listen. Go out and ask lots of questions. Say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.